I've never heard any gardener say, I planted too many bulbs last fall. True that. Welcome to the Garden Edge List, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana, where I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. And I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on several acres out in the country. We call ourselves Garden Angelists because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want others to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode. Hello, Carol. How does your garden grow? Hello, Dee. We should make a confession to our listeners right from the get-go. Okay, what? We are recording this further in advance than we most of the time record. Most of the time we record on Monday, publish on Wednesday. This one we're recording on Monday, published in a week from Wednesday. So we have to make up like garden updates and stuff. <laughs> I can't believe you're telling them that because I yeah. knew exactly what I was going to be doing. So it doesn't really matter. But and I yes, know what I'm, I'm going to be doing. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be in Portugal. So we're recording this one a week ahead. And then next week we're recording two also. Yes. Because I'm gone. I get back that Monday on the 15th, but still. And there's somebody watching my house. So I feel like I can say this stuff. That's right. So this, this is what's going to be happening in my garden. It's going to be November is leaf management season here in the garden. And that okay. doesn't mean I'm bagging them up and putting them out in the curb. Just cringe at that. That means if they're falling on the lawn, I'm mowing them. I'm getting the worst of them out of the flower beds, but not worrying about every little leaf. And then I'm going to finish up all the bulb planting because I know the week that's coming up is going to be too wet to get much planted. And I start stowing and, away stuff. And we'll talk about that in the veggie section. And so you're also going to put the shredded leaves on your garden that get mowed up. Right? Oh, yeah. And the, gr- yeah, 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 and the yeah, grass yeah. clippings, right? Yeah, you're going to dump them. Well, sometimes I just. If it's if there's not a lot of leaves down, I'll just mow them right into the lawn. But if there's a lot of leaves, then I will bag them as I go. And it takes forever because the bag fills up quickly. And then I hustle those over and dump those on the vegetable garden. Or if there's some bare places in other gardens, I'll fill it up. So that brings us to the leave the leaves campaign, which we've talked about a little bit before. Some leaves you can leave just in you know, in the situation in situ. Other leaves that are super fibrous, like some of our oak leaves in Oklahoma, I have to shred them or they just take over. So I actually have a leaf shredder that I pull the leaves off my garden beds, shred them and put them back on. Oh my gosh. I thought you almost were going to say I pull the leaves off the trees. (laughs) No. And I have two leaf falls. I have a leaf fall in the fall and I have a leaf fall in the late late winter, early spring. And so um, it's, it's some serious work out here. We have a lot of leaves. I'm not talking about somebody who has a suburban lawn with, with a tree in the front and a tree in the back. This is a big giant forest. So last year we didn't have any leaves because of the ice storm. Yep. Yep. But this year leaves are falling slowly. We'll see what happens. Um, Some things I do leave like elm trees, um, I can't think of the word cottonwoods. I leave all those leaves just on the ground. I'm not worried about those. And yes, I have fireflies. I'm not killing fireflies. That's okay. right. So in my garden, I'm going to just put things away. Um, I'm going to assume that I got all of the tomatoes and peppers out of my smart pots. And then I put the empty pots in the barn. And we'll talk more about that in our veggie section. And I'm also going to, I think I'm going to pull down the fencing that's in the driveway that they all are tied to, but I might just leave it there because it's my old driveway and we don't do anything on it. Very good. Yeah. I, I outed us D. I wasn't going to act like we're not recording this early. Just couldn't. I could have just no problem at all. Okay. Give us our first quote. I'm glad you're doing this one. The quote is a poem. I know. I will now get my poetic voice. The breezes taste of apple peel. The air is full of smells to feel. Ripe fruit, old footballs, burning brush, new books, erasers, chalk and such. The bee his hive, well-honeyed hum, and mother cuts chrysanthemums. Like plates washed clean with suds 
the days are polishing with a morning haze. And that's from John Updike. Updike. And the poem is September, but it made sense for now because of the first part. Yeah. So forget the new books and erasers part. It was right. the it was the rest of it. And forget the fact that the bee has his hive. Yes. It's it's, it's her hive. Her hive. Yeah, because almost all the bees in a beehive are female. They're all sisters. Even the queen is their sister. And then the males by this time are being kicked out of the hive to freeze to death. It's just the facts. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it's kind of sad, but it is what it is. Although I love those big fuzzy boy bees. They're sweet little guys, but it's really hard to watch them at the end of the year. I try not to. So our flower is all about bulbs, planting bulbs. So people have so many questions about planting bulbs and um, I never really think about it. So the one question that people like, how do you know when it's time? And it's based on really soil temperature more than anything, right? Kind of in the fifties, you don't want to put them into hot soil, I guess. So if your temperatures at night are down in the fifties, your soil is probably down there too. I never met. I don't take the temperature for bulb planting like I do pea planting. I don't either. And I think I, although I think these tips are great, I think this just shows how OCD people can be about a particular thing. Exactly. And bulbs really and truly, it's not hard to plant bulbs. You plant them two to three times the height of the bulb. In my case, I plant them two because over time, especially with daffodil bulbs, they pull themselves down into the soil anyway, and it just isn't that big a deal. And two is is easier to dig than three times. Sometimes no you kidding. Just, it's hard to dig. So you just go as deep as you can and hope for the best, throw them in there. Always put a little mulch on top. That'll help. <laughs> yeah. And if you want a bulb display, like some of the people who have, that have them on the Instagram where there's, you know, tons of them in an area, you can dig a trench and place all the bulbs there. You have to play place downside down, which that's the part that has the little roots coming out of the bottom. There are some bulbs that look, it's really hard to tell. I would say that the Spanish hyacinth, which is hyacinthoides hispanica, I, I think that bulb is hard to tell what, you know, just lay it on its side. If you don't know the top from the bottom, you can lay it on its side and it'll figure it out. Exactly. It wants to grow. <laughs> so any bulb you're confused about, lay it on its side. I think kind of docks is that way too. Yeah. I don't get um, too verklempt over the, I just throw them in there. In fact, one year I planted a bunch of allium. And then when I got like halfway done, I thought, oh my gosh, I have planted a bunch of those upside down. And you know what? They came up anyway. Yeah. So try not to worry too much. And the other thing is you can use a bulb auger. You can, there are bulb augers that you can fit onto your drill. Just remember that when you're, when you're using one, it's stirring up all of the soil and killing the earthworms and all that kind of stuff in that area. And also if you're like me and you have tons and tons of bulbs in an area, um, you're going to cut some of those bulbs. You may cut some of them anyway, just from digging with a trowel. So at this point in my life, I just look for a new place to put things That's right. and stick them in there. And I just don't worry about it. Now, big question that always comes up, bulb food. No, you don't need, used to be people would sprinkle bone meal down in the, the pot or the hole with the, you don't need any of that stuff. Actually, if you want to fertilize your bulbs, you would do that in the spring when they're growing. Right. Because the leaves, yeah, the leaves give them energy. You don't need to put anything in that hole. They got everything they need. No, you don't. And not only that, if you have a dog like mine and you put bone meal in that hole, you're going to have all your do- all of them dug up by your dog because my dog loves blood meal and bone yeah. meal. And then protection yeah. from critters like squirrels and chipmunks. And the answer is maybe. It depends on the bulb. And um, remember that voles like vegetation, V for voles. And moles like grubs or meat. So M for meat, V for voles. And so voles will sometimes eat your bulbs underground. And there's not much you can do about that, except for encase your tulips in chicken wire. I know people who do that. Um, squirrels will drag things around because they're crazy. And that's what they do. Yeah. And not, I will have, because I plant my whole lawn in crocus 
corms and uh, Cayonidoxa bulbs. And so mm-hmm. I will sometimes see little holes out there where I know they've dug them out. But I planted thousands and they're not digging thousands. So I just keep ahead of them. No. And I had some trouble with voles after I planted um, Tamansiensis, Caracas Tamansiensis in my garden. So I quit doing that in the, at least in the lawn. Um, also, if you want to put those kind of bulbs in your lawn, you have to remember not to mow it in the spring until later once the, all of the leaves have died back. And it looks better in a shady fescue lawn than it does in a Bermuda lawn. Because there's nothing uglier than bulbs popping up out of dead Bermuda grass. And we don't have Bermuda grass in Indiana, so it looks lovely. I bet it is really pretty. It is. I have pictures. Um, And it is pretty. It's pretty in fescue. So you can do it in a shady lawn. Yeah. So um, let's see how many, as many as you can possibly plant. And not lose your mind. I That's say. right. Because like we said at the teaser, no one, I have never heard anybody say, I planted too many bulbs last fall. I have never heard that. Have you heard that? No, I've not heard that. Now in the fall, when I'm planting those bulbs, I'm really tired. And I'm at a point now where I have so many bulbs that I only bought a few tulips this time. And I'm really interested in the little bulbs like Scylla siberica. Uh-huh. Because I like to see blue pollen pockets on my honeybees. I mean, that's really kind of silly, but you know, blue bees knees. What can you say? It's cute. Well, I bought 200 tulips, but most of the goes, most of those go to my sister's condo. And uh, cause she lives where it makes a very nice display and she gets lots of nice comments from her neighbor neighbors. And then the pink bulbs, there's just a variety of hyacinths, tulips. Uh, I don't know what else. Anadoxa. Probably uh, maybe pink one. whatever's going in that pink garden. And then I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure I ordered more crocuses or glory did. of the snow. Well, they haven't arrived yet. And they came from the same bulk company that I ordered the 200 tulips from. So I got to do a little sooth- sleuthing around through my emails. Like I did order those. I'm almost positive. I still haven't received some of my bulb orders either. And I think part of it's because they're stuck somewhere. And so, you know, you'll either get them or you won't. I have some in my garage that I ordered early, but I'm still waiting on my Van England order. Oh, but and we'll I see what happens. I bought some hyacinths at the store and I threw those in the back of the fridge to force in bloom in spring, early spring, February. January. So did you buy them in August? No, I bought them yesterday. So if you're going to force them indoors, you need them to be in your refrigerator eight to 12 weeks. I have a bunch of um, posts. If anybody is forcing on my blog, just search for forced bulbs and you'll find them. There's a lot. And you know what else? I guess we could we could link to one too. Yeah. You know, yes. So I pulled out a whole bunch of that Vinca and accidentally pulled a couple of uh, Lily of the Valley pips. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to leave those and I know where they're at. And so in a couple of weeks after we've had some good, cool weather, I'm going to try to grab those Lily of the Valley of Pips to force inside in January. I think that'll be pretty. And you can't buy them anymore. So. No, we used to buy them for years, but I've got some. I now finally have a pretty good um, stand of Lily of the Valley. It's not the easiest thing to get started in Oklahoma, but once you do, it works pretty good. Anything else about bulbs? Well, we're doing what gardeners do every single year. Think about spring? Exactly. (laughs) So here's our quote. We have neglected the truth that a good farmer is a craftsman of the highest order, a kind of artist. That's by Wendell Berry. And it comes from the gift of good land, further essays, cultural and agricultural. Wow, that sounds... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that essay <laughs> sounds very uh, scholastic, but I love the quote. Well, that that essay book, I looked it up. That was written, I believe, in 1981. Mm-hmm. And so I'm getting a copy from the library. So this is an interesting thing and has nothing to do with our veggie topic, but it has to do with that quote. Bill got up and watched. Um, I think it was sun up was the name of it, but it's because he's sick. He's got this cold. And he got up really, really early yesterday and he watched the agricultural show, which I think is sun up. It's from Cornell. No, not Cornell. It's from Purdue, which is your 
Yes. Really? And it's That's actually, yeah, I know it's your Purdue and it's actually all over. It's, it's syndicated for various places in the United States. And so by the time I got up at about seven, he was just all a fire about farmers and crops and Roundup Ready and tractors and drones and satellites. <laughs> and it had a lot of information. That's what I'm trying to say. But he starts talking to me. He goes, did you realize they have drones? Did you realize they have sat- that they use satellites to do their tractors? I said, yeah, I realized all that. And he goes, but here's the kicker. And I said, what? I said, other than the fact that farmers have a ton of money invested in their farms, tons, because those tractors and those drones don't come cheap, right? And neither does the seed that you can spray with Roundup so that it doesn't kill your crop, but kills the weeds. And he goes, yeah, he goes, they've got all this money invested. And you know what they're worried about right now? And I said, what's that? And he goes, they're worried about electric cars. Think about this, Carol. This was on the Purdue show from Purdue. They're worried about electric cars yeah. because if we go all electric with everything, then they're going to have to invest in new tractors. So just something to think about, you know, because farmers don't make that much money on their crops anyway. All right. Moving on to our veggie topic. <laughs> anyway, he was all fired up. Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things to get fired up about when you think about agriculture and that it's just uh, it's a tough business to be in. I'll just say that it's a tough business to be in. And God bless our farmers. Yeah. God bless our farmers, because it is a tough business. And in this book that I'm reading right now, this novel that you and I were talking about, the seed keepers, there's a whole section in there about the same thing that was in Jaber Crow about when we went to agricultural business, basically, instead of just regular farming, but very interesting. And uh, he was impressed that their tractors do all this stuff because he didn't know. And I said, yeah, they're real high tech now. Didn't he watch um, Jeremy Clarkson on Clarkson's farm on Amazon Prime with you? He did, but apparently it didn't sink in until he watched the show from Purdue, which he loved, by the way, and wants to watch it every week. I, I need to I need to check out this show and find a link to it so I can watch it every week. Yeah, if we can figure it out, we'll link to it. But Bill loved it. But of course he loved it. He's a paving contractor. So he thought that was all really cool because in paving, we have all that technology too. All right, our veggie topic for today. So... We did get a listener question that says, what do you do about the dirt in your containers? And we've answered this before, but let's just say it again. If you're growing vegetables in containers, you really should start with fresh, fresh dirt every year. Fresh soil. Fresh potting soil. Yes, not dirt from the garden. Because if we say dirt, they'll think dirt from the garden. Because believe me, I got that question three or four times this year. So this actually came from Jenny Brooks, who's a listener of ours. And um she said that she doesn't always replace her potting soil in the containers where she grows tomatoes. And I said, well, I vote for replacing it, especially for tomatoes or peppers or eggplant or any of those other crops, because stuff builds up in the soil over time, both bacteria problems, uh, disease problems and pests. And if you get rid of the potting soil, you're just making it that much easier And also, I think it's probably good for those um, smart pots, which is what I use. I also use these grassroots pots, but I think it's good for them to be empty. And the reason I say that is they sit up in my barn in the cold, dry air all winter long, and that has to kill some of it too. Right. And they're easier to store empty than they are full, the smart pots. Heck yeah, especially if you have 23 of them like I do. So now I have some two long boxes on my front porch and I did decide a few weeks ago, I have not replaced the soil and that those things are only about six inches deep and maybe two feet. And I thought, you know what, it's time probably on those to go ahead and dump those this fall and replace that soil for next spring because it's been in there for probably five years and it's starting to get Yeah, it's probably time. Yeah, it's worn out, if nothing else. And so I take the old potting soil and I either put it in some of my garden beds um, because over time, those garden beds um, compact, the soil in them compacts, but also it'll um, cause lots of problems with like the organic matter eventually goes away. 
And so you need to add more. So I put it in like my raised beds. I also put some of it out in my compost pile. Right. So that's, I don't throw it away because peat, if you use peat moss, it's, you know, it's a very slow renewable resource and you don't want to waste it. And if you use coir, it's, it's also, you know, not as fast, it's faster of course than peat moss, but still you want to, you want to be mindful of how you use your yeah, stuff. I have big containers on my back patio. I mean, these things are probably two feet tall and 18 inches across. And I think next spring, usually they just need a little topping off next spring. I think I'm going to go down about a foot and replace that dirt because mm -hmm. that's been the same dirt in there since I put those pots there probably eight years ago. So it's probably well past time and Things grew fine in them, but I think they'll grow even better if I replenish it. Replenish I think they'll it. grow better. And also potting soil isn't cheap. So we're, you know, we're not, it's really gotten kind of expensive over the last few years. And I was on the, all my pots that are on my back deck that I don't grow vegetables in, usually in the spring, when I pull out those plants, it takes right, away a third right. of the potting soil with the plants. I compost all of those plants and then I just use, I top it off with really good potting soil again. And, you know, use whichever good potting soil you want. Um, I've used them all. I've tested them all. That's and right. they're all pretty good. Except occasionally you'll get a bad one. But even the big M, their potting, their performance organics potting soil is fine. It works pretty good. Um, I'm going to try to switch to more core next year. But that can be a topic for another day. A topic for another day. Why don't you? Oh, it's my turn to do a quote. Yep. We are drawn to certain locations where the land resonates with us and pulls us towards it. People can spend their entire lives looking for the places where they belong, places where they feel at home, where they fit and can comfortably set down roots. And that's by Mary Reynolds, who wrote a book called The Garden Awakening, designed to nurture our land and ourselves. And that is on our bookshelf today. And this is one that you read that I hadn't read. And yes. I don't know, where did you get this one? I have, I have seen this book at the bookstore and I had not gotten it. But a listener, Mandy from Ohio, had told me that, you know, because of my writings about garden fairies and letting garden fairies write on my blog, she thought I would enjoy it. Um, and she says she keeps turning back to it for garden design. So I decided to get it. And um, so Mary Reynolds is an Irish garden designer and she won a gold at the big Chelsea flower show for design in 2002. And it was the first time she had designed a garden for the show. That just almost never, ever happens. And they made a movie about that whole process with her called dare to be wild because she planted a wild garden at Chelsea. Ooh, and she cool. said it really brought people almost to tears because it was the, you know, the landscape that they remembered from their childhood when they would be let loose in the country to run around, uh -huh. not anything like the gardens that we have today. And so um, her philosophy is that the design must involve healing the land. You've got to design with nature in mind. Mm -hmm. The design should conform to the land, not conform the land to the design and think about what the land wants to become. And in her neck of the woods, which is Ireland, she says a woodland is what the land desires to be. Mm -hmm. And so it's really um, I'm not going to say it's a book for everybody. And it is very interesting, but she has things in there like, you know, you should walk your land once a year barefoot. So there's some here that would some, be hard. There's some quirky things like that in there. Some very well, we uh, have those southern sand burrs that would that would hurt your feet. So so, so I'm just saying that there there are just some quirky things in the book, and I'm not through reading it. But I I think you know the other part she talks about, and it's very much what people are talking about these days is, um, you want to you want to have a garden that is attractive to wildlife, insects, birds. And she advocates in, an, in a new website that she has called 
we are the ARC, and ARC stands for Acts of Restorative Kindness, that she advocates taking much of your gardens back to wild places. And so whether you have small, medium, or large gardens, she thinks that there's a place where you should have native plants, places where creatures can come and go and be fed and live and breed and all that. So she advocates for rewilding a fair amount of your garden. So like I said, that's that's not exactly for everybody. Um, and she has ways to make it go fast or go slow. And that's, it's just a very different book, Dee, but I am enjoying it. I am, I'm going to finish reading it. It looks really interesting. The cover is beautiful too. It's green and it's got her or someone's profile and they're in dark blue. And it's, it's really beautiful. Ruth Evans is the name. The edgegrowgallery.com is who did the illustrations. And it is a beautifully illustrated book and there's all kinds of things. And she has design elements, you know, like the spiral and circles and uh, concentric circles. And she has a process she called forest gardening. And, you know, she has all kinds of information. But uh, so I'm going to learn a lot from it, I think. I don't. So it's interesting that you brought that up because um, over the weekend, I walked around in the upper pasture and kind of did uh-huh. a review because, the you know, I'm working on that meadow and I found some plants that are up there now that weren't up there before that I didn't plant, mm-hmm. which is nice. But they're good plants. Right? And so it, well, they are, these are good plants. And so it's starting to restore itself. And, um, it's something to think about when I was up there walking, not barefoot, but walking, I, I mow paths in that garden up there so that I can walk through it. And, um, in the process, I was thinking about how one day when I have to leave this house, I need to think about who I sell this land to, because I don't want it to turn into, I don't want somebody to plop a mobile home down in the upper pasture. True that. So anyway, that book is. Uh, the Garden Awakening Designs to Nurture Our Land and Ourselves by Mary Reynolds. And I shall finish this book. It's very interesting. Do I do the next quote or do you? You do. You do. Let's take our hearts for a walk in the woods and listen to the magic whispers of old trees. That's by Unknown, who we love. We love Unknown. Unknown is a lot of great quotes. Yeah. This is your dirt. So I found this dirt and I don't know how I found it, probably because I was doing searches for Mary Reynolds Mm -hmm. and she has a ton, there's a ton of YouTube videos and you can, you can listen to her talk about her acts of restorative kindness. She has a Ted talk out there. Um, But anyway, I found this video on YouTube about how X miners are turning toxic land into lavender farms in West Virginia. And so really cool. The process of strip mining, is, and they have a little thing on the video that shows, they basically dig down through the ground to get to the coal, pull right. all the coal out, and then rebury that hole that they had. And it looks like a gosh darn almighty mess when they're done. And it's just terrible. And they've done a lot of it in that They stage. have done a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Well, they found that in these some of these reclaimed lands, which aren't exactly the way they were because, you know, things get churned up. Sure. They found that lavender grows really well on these land. Huh. And so some of these ex coal miners, and they also um, are very open to uh, former drug addicts, former convicts, people that need a second chance. Sure. It's a place called Appalachian, Appalachian Botanicals. And they grow lavender and then they process it to get the oils and all kinds of stuff. And it's, it's really neat to see what they're doing to the land and to see these 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 rough old tumbling coal miners and stuff out there picking lavender, That's cutting really lavender. Cool. So it is very good. And um, the government has apparently committed billions of dollars to restoring this land, of course, um, in true but government bureaucracy fashion. Not a lot of it has gotten done. Imagine that. But they are <laughs> they are trying to and the the mine the miner the mine companies are responsible for reclaiming the land but i mean just putting the soil back doesn't really cut it and so these are other options that they have so anyway i thought it was a really good story and uh they do i think they have an online store and stuff and i thought you know what i think i might buy some some of their botanical stuff 
just to that's support really them. cool so anyway that is the dirt that i came up with so onto our rabbit holes um my rabbit hole has to do with cooking because we've had slightly cooler weather although tomorrow is supposed to be hot but it's been cooler lately especially in the mornings and at night and so i dusted off my slow cooker and Yay. um the, I'm having kind of a problem because it's just Bill and me now, and I'm used to cooking for a big family. And one of my friends, Karen, said, you're, pro- you're programmed that way now, so you probably can't figure out how to do it differently. And so I've kind of taken that as a, um, a, a challenge, challenge, I guess. And so a lot of these slow cooker recipes, they are not for two people. So what I do is I make soups and other meals, and then I freeze whatever's left in Ziploc bags. And I leave out one serving for me for lunch the following day. Very good. And so far that's working out pretty good. And then um, I went back to the idea because I used to do once a month cooking for my family where you do big batch cooking and then you freeze it all. But one of the things you learn in that is that when you freeze things in Ziploc bags, you make the Ziploc bags as flat as you possibly can and get all the air out of them. Right. And then you get them and you ha- you set them in your freezer up and down vertically after they've been laid flat. And so that's a good way to store them. So that's my rabbit hole this week is how do I cook for less? And in the process, how do I, you know, keep not waste anything? So there you go. And so if any listeners have some recipes for D for slow cooking, send them her way. Yeah. Not send the them ones, away. The, the ones you like, not the ones that failed. Yeah. Don't send me the failures. Okay. So what's your rabbit hole? So I'm down in a rabbit hole of family history right now. And it's because I've got a secret Christmas project involving my grandmother's diaries. And that's all I can say for now, but I'm down in that rabbit hole every night, trying to figure some stuff out, trying to give it an hour or two every night. That's wow. That's hole. a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. So um, that takes us on to well, go ahead. I was going to say Christmas is coming. I got to get this thing done. Yeah, especially if you're counting on any, you need any kind of service to help you exactly. in any way to get these things exactly. done because things are nuts this year. All right. So our garden commissions. So mine is pretty simple. I mean, it is cooling down. I got to get ready for cold winter w- weather. And so all that patio stuff has got to be stored under the big tarp. And I'm hoping to get that done by the end of the week, well before the Thanksgiving holidays. Yeah, I'm going to bring in my cushions off the patio, off the deck, and put them in the spare bedroom because I have all these bedrooms now that don't have a lot of furniture in them, which is very strange too. Being an empty nester is a whole new thing. So my garden commission is to bring that stuff in. Also keep the plants in the greenhouse watered and look around for any other cuttings I want to take. And then make sure the rest of the garden isn't dry if I'm not getting rain, because as long as we're above a certain temperature, 40 degrees, things are growing. And then I need to check on my bees for two to one sugar syrup to take them into winter. Um, So far out of my, I think I have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. I have five hives right now, five colonies. One colony is not in good shape. The others are all in really good shape. So I've got to I got to babysit that one colony and I've got to close down the entrances to be really small so that the bees don't have to get too cold because see when bees get too cold because they have to defend the area. Yeah. It's called breaking the cluster and you don't want that to happen too much in winter. No. And then <laughs> you want them to also be able to defend themselves easily. So you make a very small hole so they can go out in and out for cleansing flights. That's it. Very, very nice. We want to thank you for listening to The Garden Angelist. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us. Also hit that subscribe button so you don't miss anything. And if you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review that helps us get noticed by others. Could you also share your podcast with your gardening friends? Word of the mouth is is the best way to get the word out there. Yes, and be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And if you want to help support us, use those affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we're in a small commission and it costs you nothing. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate today. Bye until next week. Bye everybody. And next week, D. Yes. Big surprise. We start season four. That's all we're going to say about it. (laughs) That's our teaser. Bye.